I was playing Nintendo in my room and my dad came up to my room on a hot summer day and said, Hey, we've got a job to do. We're going to go mow the neighbor's yard. Yeah. And, and I didn't want to do it, but he forced <laughs> me to do it. And I made 20 bucks for cutting that yard uh, in, in about two hours. And I was hooked. I was hooked yeah. on entrepreneurialism ever since. Thanks again for doing this, Brian. You are very much appreciated. We are so excited to have you here at Leadership Stack. We have over a thousand people listening all over the Philippines and abroad. And so we have Brian here who is a serial entrepreneur. He has founded an, a company, has exited his first company and is now a tech entrepreneur from a blue collar entrepreneur. That's very interesting. We're gonna be running by some questions with him on how he's done it, some of his leadership styles and secrets. So tune in for that. So Brian, thank you for joining us here in the studio. Right on, good, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time and a lot of your insights. So you've founded two businesses. Let's talk about the first one, Peachtree. When did that start? How young were you when you started that company? Yeah, so Peachtree was a landscaping business, uh, a company that would mow people's yards, plant trees, shrubs, mulch, things like that. I was 17 years old when I started that business. And over 15 years uh, time, I grew that company from just myself and a push mower to over 150 people. And uh, in 2013, sold that company to the, one of the largest landscaping businesses in the United States. Started it when I was just a teenager. I remember the day very clearly I started that business. I was playing Nintendo in my room and my dad came up to my room on a hot summer day and said, hey, we've got a job to do. We're gonna go mow the neighbor's yard. Yeah. And, and I didn't wanna do it, but he forced <laughs> me to do it. And I made 20 bucks for cutting that yard uh, in, in about two hours and I was hooked. I was hooked yeah. on entrepreneurialism ever since. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so when were you planning when when did when did that you know idea just get into your head that oh I, i'm going to turn this into a business give me that's a great question when i was in high school i was just doing it as a way to make good money yeah uh, and then as i was in college i i, I would go to school on, on nights and weekends and i would mow grass all day long mm -hmm. and i started to realize my third year of college i was getting ready to graduate and i was kind of just in the back of my mind kind of figuring out what I was making versus what I could make after I graduated school yeah. And, yeah. and went out to the job market. I was like, wait a second, I might as well just keep doing this grass cutting thing, man, yeah. because this is, I'm going to take a pay cut. I'm really yeah. going to take a pay cut. And so uh, by the time I graduated college, I had 10 people working for me. Wow. And, and, and in school, I went to business school and I was able to apply some things I learned in business school on yep. how to grow, how to grow the business. And, and, and when I, when I was 23 and I had finished school, I thought, okay, let's do this. Let's make a, make a real business out of this. And, and what, there was what, just no, no looking back. What did your dad say when you were, when you were turning it into a business? <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, uh, he said, you know, I never really would have thought you would have ran with it like this. I'm so glad that I, uh, he said, he said, I'm so glad that I, I put you on to running your own landscaping business and not becoming an ice skater or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> oh my something God. you can make money at. <laughs> and, and your dad, your dad was one of the biggest influences in your life, was he? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was really influential in terms of teaching me how to become a leader because as I grew that company from 10 to 20, to 50 to 100 to 150 people i had to yeah. kind of go through the school of hard knocks of learning how to become a good leader yeah. and and a manager and uh, my dad uh, who had a military background taught me uh, what it meant to be a good leader and how to do that and, mm -hmm. and, and would point out things i was doing wrong mm -hmm. and uh, turn me on to guys like john maxwell 
and others that I just learned a lot of my leadership style from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're from Nashville, Tennessee, which means that you listen to Dave Ramsey, one of the biggest people, personalities, especially in small to medium business that I look up to. Highly Person. controversial, but yeah, I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so am I, so am I. And this controversy just makes it sweeter. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> so you were you were leading from yourself, right? So it was just you when you were 17 years old. And oh my gosh, you were a teenager then. It's so hard to lead yourself during that time. But there is something that sparked in you. And when was it when you realized you had to hire more people? You, you start to understand that you're leaving money on the table. You can't get to it all, especially in, in, when you're starting a business, just yourself, you're doing yeah. everything, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're doing the marketing, you're doing the reset, you're answering the phone, you're doing the physical work, you're doing the invoicing, everything you're doing. And you start to understand that, man, I just can't get to all the work that is coming my way. Yeah. And you start to understand I'm, I could make more money and I could provide opportunity for somebody else if I just brought on a helper. Yeah. And that sounds a lot easier than it really is. <laughs> you don't understand how hard that's going to be. Uh, in many ways, going from zero employees to one employee is as hard as going from 10 to 20. Yeah. Because you're doubling your business and you don't have the resources and you really are taking a leap of faith. And there might be some weeks that you personally aren't going to get a paycheck, but your employee will. Yeah, that that's true. Mean, happened to me many times over running my businesses that my employees got paid before I did. Mm -hmm. And so it was a leap of faith. Glad I did it. But most business owners, particularly in, in that industry, never do. They, they remain solo entrepreneurs. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But there's a difference between being self-employed and being a business owner. Yep. And, and uh, there's a subtle distinction there. And once you start hiring employees and putting systems around a business, that's when you become a business owner. Right. And so one of the questions that I'm super interested in, because we struggled with this at SEO Hacker when we were starting out, is hiring. So how did you hire during that time from yourself to one to 10 employees? What was your hiring process? What did it look like? Yeah, so the, the first helper is basically you try to you know, I remember a movie back in the 90s with Michael Keaton called Multiplicity where he was able to clone mm -hmm. himself. Yeah. You, you are literally trying to clone yourself. Mm -hmm. And you realize that nobody's going to work as hard as you do. Nobody's going to do it exactly like what you, what you want. And you, uh, for me personally, I just, I just beat my head against the wall for years. Mm -hmm. And luckily I came across a book called The E-Myth. And this book is about a lady who opened up her own bakery because she loved making pies. And what she quickly learned was that there's a big difference between making pies and running a business that sold pies. And the book takes you through the process of creating systems around every role within your business. And, and even like in the, in the early days, you could probably have 10 or 12 roles in your business. It's just going to be your name on all of them. So once you kind of go through that mental exercise of understanding that, like in my business, there was, there was a sales guy and there was a receptionist and there mm -hmm. was a crew foreman and then a helper mm -hmm. and then a quality assurance person. And it was my name on all of these roles. Right. But as I, as I started to hire one, two, three, four people, I was able to scratch my name off that, that role and right. put somebody else in there and, and, and literally go through the exercise of creating a, document that mm -hmm. you hand to that person to under, so they understand what's expected of them the roles and goals yep. of that of, of that position so you created like process documents expectation documents what winning looks like all of these things it, it, way too late year four or five if i had done it year one it would have saved me two or three years no one does it on year one, my friend. No. I haven't done it on year one. <laughs> so I kind of hacked my way through it. You know, I yeah. did it wrong. Yeah. I had to do yeah. it wrong uh, yeah. many years, and then I did, then I did it right. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, I think I, we started doing it year four, year five, so you're pretty much on time with that one. <laughs> uh, you got to do it every wrong way you can before you do it the right way. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So you were you were leading from 10 people to 150 people. 
that's huge and i'm wondering like how do you lead 150 people i'm leading 50 people right now ages 20 to 31 i'm 31 i'm the oldest guy in seo hacker and it's tough leading 50 millennials and centennials but you're leading 150 people from all ages from all different generations how were how how, how did you do that yeah and in, in, in building that business most everybody that worked for me was older than me because this was all mm. throughout my 20s yeah and uh it wasn't without its challenges and there's you know there's a million there's there's a million pieces of advice on this what what worked for me was investing in the culture of the business and making this business run like a family and less less than like a big company so so for for us it was why are we here? Why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, for me, the book Start With Why by Simon Sinek was, was really, really influential in how I built the culture around that business. And for us, we would always look at the company, look at the business as the vehicle of prosperity for everybody that was in it. Right. And yes, we served our clients. Yes, we took care of our customers. Yes, we did make the world a, a little bit of a more beautiful place by maintaining the the landscaping in the parks that we did. Mm -hmm. Literally. But, <laughs> yeah, literally that was, you know, uh, something we did and that yeah. was like the what, right? Like yeah. that was what we did and how we did it was through, through quality, relentless execution of our services. But the why we did it, how, what, why mm -hmm. uh, was because if, if we did it right, we held on to our clients and the company won, everybody wins. Yeah, and the way we were able to distill that uh, one of the one of the fun things we were able to do was every quarter we would we would identify some sort of project or initiative that one of our people wanted to do. Uh, so, like a lot of our, our our operating core of the business were immigrant workers from Central and South America, and so they would come up and work for the company and go back. Uh, or they might stay two or three years and they would send a lot of their money back home to, to, mm -hmm. to support their families. And a lot of times they, they would identify as like, Hey, I want to build a supermarket in Guatemala mm -hmm. and I could get it going. I just need a loan for $25,000 and we would interest free loan that money to make that happen. And we did that a couple of times. We're like, man, it's a lot of fun. So we started codifying it into like a process where every quarter we had, would have this panel of people within the company that would look at all these proposals from the hundred some odd people that worked there. And we would help somebody buy a house. We would help somebody start a business back home, buy a new car, put your kid through school, whatever. It was all kinds of different stuff. And then we would follow up on that. And then in our, in our all hands meetings, we would, we would talk about the progress. Like, Hey, hey here is how Jorge's soccer stadium is doing in Mexico city. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we built a soccer arena, like, awesome. like a little indoor soccer arena. Yeah. And these were, these weren't like grants, they were loans, but they were interest free. And, right. and, and we got paid back on nine out of 10 of them. And so it That's almost awesome. didn't really cost the company much money. It took some effort, but it made it a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and, uh, we, when we went through the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, uh, in the United States, that wiped out a lot of our competitors. Uh, mm -hmm. It wiped out a lot of businesses that were in our industry. Yeah. And we were able to survive through it because of our strong culture, because mm -hmm. we kind of banded together and got through it. Yeah, that's awesome. Even during this time that we are in a pandemic, I think culture is going to be one of the strongest points that will make strong teams thrive, not just, you know, absolutely weak teams are going to get wiped out. That's really how it is. Absolutely. And if you had it in place going into this, your chances of, of coming out of it are, are tenfold. Yeah. But if you had a weak culture going in, mm, it's going to be tough. Yeah, you're just wallowing in stress and anxiety right now if you had a weak tough. culture. You can't, you can't go back and install a culture real quick. Yeah. This is stuff that has to be embedded, ingrained in the DNA of the business or the company for, yeah. for a long time. Yeah. So I, what, something that I say is the, the champion is not made in the ring. It's he's made during training, during, you know, his in the that's locker room, right. you prepare for that, that fight in the ring. And that's, that's right. what you did. You had a great culture going on for you. You had to communicate every day. Patrick Lanchione says the CEO is also the CRO or the chief reminding officer to so keep that's reminding right. people every day. This is why we do it. This is why we do it. Look at 
look at what Jorge built an indoor soccer stadium. This is why we're doing what we're doing. And so you ingrain that culture every day so that when tough times come, you have a strong team that will band together rather than pull each other apart. That's and well said. 150 people oh my gosh that's huge and you were you were in your 20s that is super impressive folks i hope you learned from what brian said about building strong cultures that's how you do it it's an all for one game one for all right 